Hey, Gen Bex, I'm really excited to take you to a part of Mexico that I have never been to, and that is Oaxaca. So I've got a guest with me today who is going to talk all about uh, her journey around Mexico and settling into Oaxaca and buying property. And she's going to talk about the seven things she learned or the seven things she wishes she knew before buying property in Mexico. So this will be great if you're thinking about buying property specifically in Oaxaca. But a lot of this is going to apply to Mexico overall. So I have Donna with me today, and she is going to... Um, share this with you, but she's sharing it not from Oaxaca. She's actually in Key West, Florida, uh, which has a special place in my heart. And I'll tell you about that a little bit later on. But let's meet Donna and have her introduce herself. And um, yeah, let's, uh, let's hear about that part of like, um, maybe why she's in Key West and also what uh, had her going around in that selection journey across Mexico. Hey there, how are you, Brighton? <laughs> I'm doing wonderful. Well, yes, I am here in Key West, which actually has been my home since 1985, you could say. Uh, I've been living the dream since um, way back when. I, um, you know, I relocated here before working remotely was a thing mm -hmm. and uh, managed to make it work for many, many years. And uh, it's it's been a great life here. But um, about two years ago, right as we were all crawling out of the pandemic, we finished uh, renovating and flipping a house here in Key West and decided, hmm, it's time to get on the motorcycle again and uh, head south. And so we started on what ended I, up being... Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause you there for a second and ask you, so you've been doing this... Uh uh, ability to work from anywhere. Is it, was it kind of re renovating and flipping houses? Is that what you guys were doing, uh, prior in the last, since 1985, since you got, no, to no, 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 no. I, um, I came down here after quitting, you know, my corporate job. Uh, my training is as a registered dietitian and I worked not as a clinical dietitian as most people do, but I worked for large food brands. So it was really more nutrition marketing and communications work which at the time, as long as you had a fax machine, you could make it work. So um, that's what I was doing here. I traveled a great deal, did a lot of recipe development, wrote cookbooks, and it was a great gig for many, many years. So it's like you were like a fax machine nomad instead of a digital nomad. It's like I the, the precursor. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, um, I, I am going to jump right in with my my Key West story because, um, yeah, I think folks should know. And um, so if you saw on the bottom of the screen, of course, my name is Brighton West. And that is not coincidental that uh, that we're talking about Key West because I was married in Key West. And so Kat and I took the last name West. When we got married, we got married at the Red Rooster Inn. Um, uh, and I can't remember the name of the road. It's not Duval, but like one of the major roads that crosses that. Um, we had <laughs> all of our guests there got married out by the pool. And that's when I took the name Brighton. And uh, we took the last name West together. So Kat grew up down in Isla Mirada down in the Keys. So uh, it's definitely a special wow. place in our heart. And I love your very Key West wear today. Um, <laughs> I think Key West and Mexico are kind of, uh, they're very similar in terms of the the attitude of people, uh, yes. the colorfulness, um, except for the chickens. The chickens should never have been run off from Key West. I, there are so many roosters out front right now. I hope we don't hear them. <laughs> oh, okay. So the, the roosters, okay, because I had I'd heard they'd all gotten kind of kicked out of Key West. No, 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 they're no. They're still no. around. <laughs> okay. So, but, um, okay, so that's that's the Key West part. Let's go now to you. You're hopped on a motorcycle yeah. and you're heading south. Yes, we uh, started the trip two years ago, leaving Key West uh, over a three-month block of time with kind of a loose itinerary and um, hit about 30 cities, towns, villages, whatever, really kind of scouting for where might we want to relocate. And uh, I had never been a motorcycle rider before I met Gary 10 years ago. Uh, I don't ride on my own bike. I'm the passenger. 
And, you know, bike riding, you're either terrified of it or you love it. And, and I love it. So it was a great way to experience Mexico through the mainland and then over through Baja. And we ended up coming back to Oaxaca after all of that. Um, actually, I just came back from an eight month trip in Oaxaca where we stayed to really do more of a deep dive. And as we all know, it's, you know, one thing to spend a few days of vacation in a place, but it's a very different ball game. If, if you want to live there, you're looking at it through a different lens. So we just returned from eight months in Oaxaca and so where we were rent doing rent. a lot of scouting. Yeah. So you, did you drew rent? Did you want rent one place? Did you rent multiple places? Did you Airbnb kind of like a lot of people are in this phase where they're just thinking about a town and, um, you know, there's a lot of folks who are like rent there for a while. Some of us like myself, you know, bought in a town we'd never heard of, uh, just, you know, 24 <laughs> hours great. after we landed. Um, so yeah. So tell us about your, um, your last eight months down there. Yeah. So we, uh, rented five different places over the course oh, wow. of this eight so months in you really different, checked neighborhoods. Out different parts, different neighborhoods, because each neighborhood has a different vibe. The transportation mm-hmm. needs are different. I mean, Yes, it was a pain. You know, we have to pack everything up on the bike and move, but but it was really necessary to to do it the, this way. And I'm I'm glad we did because it, it gave me the chance to really zero in on on what I like, what I don't like, the kind of house I'm looking for, and um, so so I I'm glad we had the time to do that. Not everyone has the luxury to to put that much time into a scouting trip. Yeah, well, you know, we didn't say we we're talk about talking about this in advance, but can you give me an idea of what rents were? I mean, are these like one bedroom, two bedroom houses, like about, and they were furnished, of course, in short term yeah. leases. So, you know, people think like, oh, it's so expensive when you, you know, when they hear someone talking about it. It's like, well, we're talking about a really nice part of town, typically, or a nicer part of town. We're talking, you know, safe part of town. And we're talking about a furnished rental, not a, a regular rental that comes with no refrigerator or stove, whatever it is in Mexico that they're usually missing. Um, And we're talking about a short-term rental, which usually is during the high season. So um, if you decide to move somewhere and you're going to be a renter, um, these prices probably are not in line with what you would experience being a typical renter that is going to furnish your place. Uh, You might live in the same neighborhood, but you're going to sign a a year-long lease, which is going to be a lot less. But let's hear about what kind of pricing did you see? So we were in Airbnb type places. Some uh, actually I booked on Airbnb others. There's a lot of Facebook pages about housing. Uh, so I was working directly with owners and typically we were either in a two or three bedroom house, um, a one bedroom, little apartment uh, unit a, a two bedroom, you know, so it was kind of all over the place. But generally speaking, uh, I never spent more than thirteen hundred dollars a month, and that was probably for that um, three bedroom house. But I also was in a very central location. That was one of the criteria for me. I, I wanted to be able to walk everywhere. So although we had a motorcycle and we did have transportation. Um, if I went further out, um, you know, 20, 30 minutes outside of city center, sure, I could pay a lot less rent. But for for what we were looking to do, uh, we wanted to stay in town and be walkable to go to the markets, to walk to yoga, to, you know, get to our favorite restaurants out for you know, a glass of wine at night with without having to take the bike out. So I'd say anywhere between a thousand to twelve, thirteen hundred. And mm-hmm. and there are places that are even less expensive. But again, it depends on what kind of amenities that you want to have. Not every place had air conditioning, which in the winter was no big deal, really. Uh, of course, as you get into April and May, it gets pretty warm. So, you know, we were glad that last month of April that we had AC in the bedroom. And and that's what you'll often find is there may be AC in the bedroom, but not in the rest of the unit. So for us, um, and again, I, I having come from Key West where our rental prices are so insane, for me, 
a thousand twelve hundred dollars a month is is a good value as far as I'm concerned. And that is a, a great point because I do usually the people who comment uh, that they hear that these rental prices are so high or the prices for housing are so high are coming from a place like, you know, Moscow, Idaho, um, or someplace where where housing prices are very inexpensive. And you have to really put yourself in the right frame of mind in that a lot of the places, at least where uh Americans, Canadians are relocating to in Mexico are usually the nicer cities. It's, you know, there, I mean, there are some people who are moving. I did an interview with someone who moved to um, San Pablo, San Pancho, can't remember, one of them, um, outside of La Paz, and it was much less expensive because uh, sure. he was in a small town, uh, and but that was close to a big city. So really, you, you kind of have to find the comparison to a, another major U.S. city that is really nice. I mean, people move to Key West because it's an amazing place to live. And that's why they moved to Oaxaca too. So um, yes. just from a comparison standpoint, let's make sure we're comparing apples to apples, uh, not, you know, Moscow to Key West. I mean, you'd see the same thing there if you were to try to compare sure. those two places. Yeah. Okay. So sorry to keep jumping in, but no. I love getting the details and, and hearing the whole story. So you've been there for eight months and decided, hey, we want to stay. Yes, uh, we we liked it that much, and uh, so we started this house hunting process, which was quite a learning experience, to say the least, because it is nothing like buying property here in the states, at least not anything I've been used to. And as I had mentioned, you know, we buy and renovate property, so we're kind of experienced at this, and. Um, when we first started this, uh, the, the the first aha was, oh my gosh, there's no such thing as an MLS listing service. There is no one central location to go see what's for sale. And, and I know this varies throughout Mexico. I, I know from talking to other people that in other towns and cities, you may have an MLS, but not in Oaxaca. And, and you may have multiple MLS. Uh, services. Um, that's another thing. And wow. I know I learned this in uh, Puerto Vallarta. One of them might be legitimate and one of them might not be. So it's kind of like if you're, if you find something on a certain MLS, you can be pretty confident. If you find something on a different MLS, you, you have to be a little bit uh, uh, leery of what you might be getting yourself into. And I think a lot of homes are just sold. Just, you know, people will put up a for sale sign and yes. wait someone knocks on the door. So, yeah. uh, but and there's a lot probably, of that, you know, it's probably something where the, the closer, maybe the closer you are to the U.S., the more it is like uh, the U.S. But Oaxaca is kind of a, although there are a lot of foreigners that live there, it's it's probably a much smaller portion than other areas in Mexico that I've been to. Yes, I certainly there's an expat community um, and those that have bought there and, and people have been there for quite some some time. It is a hunt and peck process. Um, <laughs> so. It is, it is on you as the buyer uh, to do your due diligence um, to, I spent a lot of time. It's a, I, I would, I would say it was very time consuming because I would just comb these Facebook pages looking for listings. And, and there's a lot of Facebook pages, you know, Oaxaca houses for rent uh, or, or sale, you know, and, and so you're just kind of hunting through all of these and contacting the owners directly. Sometimes it may be a realtor who has put that post up. Um, and what one of the the the, the next things that no, number two thing that was sort of a a surprise to me is that um, because there is no MLS, every realtor kind of has their own little pocket of listings, so that you know. This person has these houses and here and there, but in some cases they may share listings. So it's it's a little bit difficult to to understand how the game is played at first. And I I learned this kind of the hard way because uh, one realtor I'd gone out with a few times, I come to find out had taken my headshot from my Facebook page and put it in a WhatsApp message that they sent to other realtors and said, 
oh, this is my client. I'm looking for this, this, and this kind of a house for them. And then all these other realtors chimed in and said, hey, I've shown her a house. What do you mean? She's not your client. She's mine. Uh, so. Yeah, it is definitely confusing because there is this like in the realtor world, it's like, OK, you know, what client can have one realtor, but the realtor can't have all the houses. So it it becomes something a little tricky to to navigate. I it, guess. It, it was. And so once I figured this out, I, I from then on, I was very upfront with any realtor and said, you know, I'm working with a variety of people. This is what I want. Show me what you have. And and then I kind of got into the groove of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, you know, you learn as you, as you go along. Um, but one of the other things that was new to me was that realtors there do not need to be licensed as opposed to here in the States where there is certainly a, a criteria for being in business. I I could say I'm a realtor, you know, and anyone can say that any day of the week. So you'll find that the knowledge level of realtors vary. Some really know their business and and others are just sort of throwing it out there. Yeah. And actually, that's something in La Paz, at least. uh, And maybe I don't know if this is state by state, municipality by municipality, city by city. But in La Paz, I know that the realtors have to pass some kind of test because I have friends who are realtors and they went through um, you know, kind of proving some some level of competence, uh, probably nowhere near what is expected in the United States. Um, but I think there are also a lot of people, gringos in particular, that that hang their their uh, hat yes. out, or hang out their shingle, and say, "I'm a realtor now," and they pass the test, and they haven't necessarily sold any houses yet. Um, and just because it is easy, and it is something where. If you're living down there, you're like, oh, this is something I could do. I could show people houses. This will be fun. So, um, and it usually shakes out after a little while. But um, yeah, I definitely see it happening. But I also think there is some, like maybe continuing education or continuing testing that happens in La Paz, at least, or in Baja California Sur. So yeah, I I don't know that that's the case in in Oaxaca, and and we've been lucky through personal connections. You know, we sort of clicked in with a few realtors that you know we we love these women. They happen to be women, mm-hmm. um, and and we kind of then just sort of stuck with two or three of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what I also learned is the same house can vary in price depending on what realtor is showing you. So <laughs> that is a big difference compared to here in the mm-hmm. States where you're looking at a listing and the price is very transparent. So depend, again, that was sort of a watch out for me when I was, sh- be- I was shown the same house I had seen a week prior. Oh, but now the price was different. And sometimes the price would be more and sometimes it's less. <laughs> <laughs> So again, it's it's buyer beware. You really, really have to do your homework and you only learn these things, you know, by being in the trenches with it. So it it as I said earlier, it was it's been quite a learning experience. Um and you know, because we've renovated houses here, when we started this, we said, Oh, we're going to buy a property that needs renovation. We we can handle this. Mm-hmm. Well, we've kind of changed our thinking on that because for a few reasons. And while we we have the skills ourselves and however, you know, in Mexico, the cost of labor is much less than what it is here in the States. And we thought, well, we could certainly hire a crew to do a lot of the work that uh, needs to be done. And then we realized You know, even after seven months of being in language classes, (laughs) our Spanish is not good enough to manage a construction crew. And when you stop and think about that, it's like, well, I can order in a restaurant and I can go shopping. But the vocabulary needed to work on a renovation project is a very different thing than being able to order in a restaurant. And, And we sort of had a reality check with ourselves that you know, we, we don't feel that we can really handle the, the, the kind of language translation that, that would be necessary. And we also watched some American friends of ours over the eight months as they renovated a home, beautifully done, finally. 
But because of the communication challenge, you know, windows get put in and taken out maybe four times because there's a miscommunication. It's just not being done right through no fault of anyone, really. But but that was something that we really kind of took to heart and and said to ourselves, you know, maybe we don't want to take on quite so much. (laughs) The, The other thing that kind of became apparent to us was because the permitting process is very different, of course, in Mexico, Uh, than what we have here, you know, very, very rigorous permitting requirements. A lot of times the electrical, the plumbing, uh, you know, on the one hand, it can be a good thing. You're like, oh, good. I don't have to deal with all that red tape. But on the other hand, then, you know, are you are you are you getting into a situation where the electrical might look a little sketchy or it's not being done to the standards that you and I might like? So. Yeah. So that made us a little nervous too. Yeah. And that is something that is just, I think that is probably reality across Mexico yeah. is you get to experience the good and the bad of the permitting system. And, you know, for us, we have a, a really amazing pool and there's no fence around it, which would have been required in the United right. States, but the pool was not grounded. So, or the, the, the lights in the pool were not grounded. It was just, you know, they don't yeah. know what GFIC outlets are. They don't know what, I mean, the circuit breakers that just like, boom, blows their mind. Right. Uh, very hard to buy things like that. You usually have to have it shipped down from the U S. Yeah. So I think, um, there are more contractors in La Paz at least, and I'm sure other parts of Mexico that are kind of catering to people from the U S to say, okay, well, we know that the. Um, the gringos like their outlets every six feet or whatever it is, because right. that is not a Mexican standard by any means. You might get one outlet in a room, um, but they know they're like, okay, well, this is what's going to be expected. The house is going to be a little more expensive than what you see. Like, right. it's like oh, well, why is this local house so inexpensive? It's like, well, cause it is very different. Um, we yeah. like to have our, our ground protected outlets, uh, you know, a lot of things like that, but we, we don't want things like fences around our pools. So you kind of have to work through that. And the the, the, yes. colors of the wiring in the house are just another mind blowing. Like you can find purple wire in there. If that's what they had. That it, I, we, we would walk down the street and, and th- this is the kind of stuff that we notice. Uh, Gary's like, Oh my God, I, I, I can't believe that spaghetti mess of wiring, you know, uh-huh. that's hanging off the outside. Um, <laughs> maybe most people don't notice stuff like that, but we do because you know, this is what we do. So um, we we have backed off a little bit on the level of renovation that we're willing to do. So, well, actually, I want to back up one more time because I have one more thing that I heard you say, and that's that windows get installed four times. And I'm starting to realize that I maybe made a mistake when they, we did a really small project. I thought it was very clear on how the window was to open. It was just a window project. And they installed the window and sure enough, it was backwards. And I was like, oh, you want to get the other way. And they're like, oh, well, we'll fix it. And I'm like, well, you know, it's not like they can just flip it over. It's like, it's going to have to be rebuilt. Maybe there's this expectation that that's what you know, it's built into the price that of course they're going to install it four times. But I felt bad. I was like, okay, well, you know, I'll just have it go the other direction. It's like, it's not going to have the same view into the guard when it's open. But um, yeah, I think that's also maybe um when working with people that are the higher end uh uh, contractors they're probably going to come to expect that you are going to make more requests and it's going to be built into the price up front versus the contractors that are used to working with mexicans um which i've had them too um their expectations are different Uh, just the way they do things it's like if it's if it's done, then it's done versus us. We have more aesthetical, aesthetic requirements. Typically. Yes, exactly. Um, so you're, you're right. You know, there's, there, there's some rules and requirements that, you know, we're, we're happy not to have to deal with, but then things like plumbing and electrical. Yeah, that really matters. It, it, it has to be right. So mm-hmm. I, I think, you know, and what ended up happening through all of this, Gary and I just could not agree on a house that ticked all the boxes for him and for me. So we have not yet pulled the trigger on a purchase. So our intention is when we return now in October, 
Um, we have a six month rental lined up. So we're in one stable place in Oaxaca and we will resume the house hunt again. So I, and I think we had to go through this process of really knowing what is it that we want? How much do you want to bite off in terms of renovation work? And now when we look again, we'll, we'll be looking with a different eye and willing to do some work, but, but not willing, you know, to put a second level on a house or go really, really deep into it. Like we were anticipating, you know, this first time around. So, um, it, it, it's a necessary process, I think, that that you go through, whether it's going to be your full-time home, a part-time home, you know, just an investment property. It, it doesn't matter, but buying a property is a big deal. And especially having never done it in another country, you know, one, one of the other things that I never, ever had considered, because we own property here, you know, we, we have everything in our trust and we have our estate planning done and, oh, it's all very neat and packaged. And then we realized after talking to our attorney and we have a great English speaking attorney, he's like, well, you know, if you buy property in Mexico, it needs to go into a Mexican will. Whatever you have set up in the U.S. doesn't cover your property here. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what? I mean, is so, that anything we ever think about? So Oaxaca, or at least the area you're looking at, is far enough inland. I always think of Oaxaca being like right on the water, like Huatuco or something like that. But Oaxaca, so if you are within 30 miles or something of the border, of the uh, the border or the water, uh, the ocean, you have to have a fee to Camiso. Um, and thus it's a, it's a Mexican trust. So theoretically you could avoid having the will because your home is put into a trust and the trust, you can't sign the trust or they won't give you the trust unless you have, um, beneficiaries. So it's built mm -hmm. in, but if you're a little bit further inland, Mexico city, Guadalajara, uh, Oaxaca, um, yeah, the requirements. Yeah, you you've got to have a way to pass on your property, which is probably something you should have anyway. And I'm actually going to be doing a video about uh, essentially dying in Mexico. So that's a video that's coming up. Is you know what should you be planning just in case your end should come while you're you know you're a U.S. citizen or Canadian citizen, but your end should come while you're in Mexico. So that's coming up. But one thing also, I wanted to back up a little bit, and that was to talk about you guys are are renovators and you're talking about doing this work yourself um i don't want to scare people off too much because you could hire a good architect to do a renovation and uh the the key is you want to hire a architect that works with gringos that is is really mm -hmm. kind of well versed in that so that your outlets are going to be you know six feet apart instead of 47 or whatever it is um speaks english uh, so that he can communicate with the crew so that you can communicate only with you know one person who speaks English and they can be like, oh yeah, turn the papers right side up, not upside down. Uh, <laughs> that's a true experience at my house. Um, <laughs> if you come visit, you will see the upside down papers still there. Um, so, And I have another video coming up, actually a series of videos about building a custom home in Mexico. But the guy who is uh, who's featured in the video his house is a renovation essentially it was a half built house that was sitting there for years and it was just a shell of a house and it was kind of like it was not well built or anything but he looked at it and had a vision for what he could create with that and how he could uh you know engineer it to fix the problems that were there. And actually the wiring had all been stolen anyway. So it's like he was going to rewire it the proper way. Uh, but, and the original construction was not done uh, to any kind of engineering standards. So he, but he, he built it for himself and he knew how to build it. Right. So there are people who can fix these renovations and turn them into amazing properties. Yeah. Uh, but that, that video will be coming out soon or a series of videos about uh, custom homes in Mexico, because if you want something that's unique to you, building a custom home is, is an amazing process. And it's something that most of us wouldn't have access to in the United States because building a custom home can be really expensive. So we're going to talk sure. about custom homes versus like spec homes versus like somewhat customized homes. But in this video, um, you know, 
we're, we're talking more about property. So this is just your um, experience going through the process to buy any type of property. But I just wanted to mention, uh, don't be too afraid of renovations as long as um, really you don't have anything more than a vision. If you've got the skills to know how to do it and you're going to try to do it yourself. Um, yeah, we yeah, we we backed off of that a little <laughs> bit. So uh, I'm I'm not that big a glutton for for punishment. Um, right. But but we do like getting our hands dirty and and I and I think for a lot of people coming down, it's hard for them to have a vision and and to you know to put the pieces together. And that's having gone through this process now. I'm I'm thinking to myself, gosh, now I know what questions to ask. Um, I know that if I were going through this again, one of the other things I would do from the get go, which I kind of did toward the end was bring a translator with me to these showings because most of the realtors, if not all, did not speak any English. Interesting. So I now have two translators who I love. And not only do they go with us to the DMV to get the plates for our mm -hmm. motorcycle and other things like that, but when I go to a showing now, I mean, the questions I have to ask need translation. So that's nothing that I had thought about at the beginning, but I quickly realized how important that was. So, you know, the level of detail that I, as an American buyer, the kind of questions I'm asking, it's it's not like you're getting a sheet uh, when you go to look at a property here in the U.S. and you have all the specs and you have the the tax history and you and you have all of this information written down about the house. None of that is happening. So you're asking all those questions while you're standing there at a at a showing. So having a translator along uh, who can also kind of act like a bit of a guide, I, I have found, because in Mexico, um, and I think this is across Mexico, um, the notaries play a very big role in the uh, administrative aspect of your paperwork when buying a property. So in addition to having an attorney, I also had a, a notary who I was asking questions of as I was looking at houses via the translator. So, you know, I'm just somebody who likes to like cover all my bases and I'd rather know up front what, what the potential challenges are with ownership. I mean, that's another whole discussion of, can you even buy this property? So having a translator was something else that I found crucially important. Yeah. And I will agree because a translator is not only going to help you with the language, but also the culture of like, yeah. uh, you know, they, having that person who's there, who in your language can tell you, yeah, uh, shouldn't call this person on a Sunday because that's family day. You know, you can't ask that question now, or you can because they're a realtor or, you know, like all these different things so that they can just make sure you don't, um, that you get the information you need, but also that you don't insult people just because of the way you might ask it in Spanish is not the way it should technically or, or culturally be asked. So I'm a big fan. Um, uh, and there's a number of people out there who will do this, who are locals and you can and hire a local and they're usually very inexpensive yes. to just come along with you and, and translate and be your assistant. Um, ben is uh, one of the guys that I work with and I'm going to have a video with him soon just of trying to get a license plate for my car, but uh, that'll be a short video. But anyway, that's one of my go-to guys in La Paz or in El Centenario. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely good to have allies, local allies. Oh, for, for sure. So, you know, now after eight months, I have this little network of, you know, the English speaking attorney, the translators, a couple of realtors that I really like. I, I, I have this little network of people that I feel like I can rely on, that I'm going to get truthful answers. And um, it just, it just makes the whole process a whole lot easier. And, you know, but, but I had to slog through it. So um, it's, it, it is, quite a challenge. Um, the, the last thing I will mention that was not anything I would have thought of when looking for a property in Oaxaca, as is the case in a lot of Mexico, 
there are severe water shortages and getting water is a problem. And so what I have learned when looking for a property is, yes, you can get water from the city and during dry spells and droughts, that becomes a very sporadic situation. Maybe once a month, you're going to get water from the city. So in between, you need to know that you can buy water from a private company. You know, the truck comes with the big hose. Mm-hmm. But that means you have to have a property with a lot of big water tanks. And that's not anything I would have thought of, but that is a selling feature. Certainly when realtors show you a house, they'll say, look, there's this 10,000 10, liter water tank on the roof. And there's another one, you know, over here. That's really important. And I would have never thought of that. That is so true. Yeah, we call them PIPA trucks in the pods. I know there's other names for them around Mexico. But yeah, I think I think 10,000 is maybe the size of the truck. So if you have that size, that's a size um, cistern that we have, uh, we can fill it up. And yeah, actually, the other thing is, and I think I have a video about Tanacos, uh, which are the ones that sit on the roof, uh, and are gravity fed, which don't have a lot of pressure, but have water if your power goes out because power can also be a little bit sketchy in mexico um but yeah the idea of water coming high pressure to your home every day is probably not something anywhere in mexico um you know from the city um that's part of why the water is is not that you can't drink the water is just because the water system as I understand, when it comes out of the plant, you can just take it and drink it, and it's wonderful. Yeah. But that whole network has got lots of holes, and the water pressure drops, and it's kind of like they go around town and they turn the water on and off to kind of make sure that everyone's getting some water. It's a little bit, but but you got to store it on site when you get it, and yeah, and and get a, a truckload if you if you run out and need it. Actually, I have a a little sensor that's tied into my alarm system that tells me when my uh, when you're my getting low, getting pretty low because Smart. something's going on and I want to know about it before it gets down to the point where the pump isn't pumping anything anymore because that's happening. Right. So, um, yeah, so I think you've gone through the seven seven things now. Uh, yes, and any other kind of. Uh, thoughts uh i or, or like what's next in your journey you said you have a place rented and we, you're going to be going do. back um and i'm really psyched about this place it's in um the neighborhood of holly latka which is adorable very centrally located um it because it's become trendy rents have gone up and you know the story in oaxaca is the same i'm sure in just about any town where there are expats and digital nomads people have been there for five ten years there everyone's complaining about how much the rent has gone up and the prices of houses as well um i managed to negotiate directly with the owner and uh, got what i feel is a really good price for um this three bedroom three bath house with a fabulous rooftop terrace Mm. and uh so we'll be there for six months and we'll start house hunting again Uh, we left the motorcycle there we actually imported it so now it's legally a mexican bike Mm -hmm. and we'll just fly back down yeah that is nice actually the i i mentioned that i wanted to get my my license plate switched over with ben and we ended up failing um i did not manage to get license plates in the end just because some tricky stuff some baja california stuff it's the rules are different on the mainland than the baja um it's mexico things you know no matter (laughs) like sometimes you think it's going to work perfectly and it just eh, sometimes it just doesn't work out but yeah uh, i can still have u.s plates in baja california sewer so no we're um, we're very excited to get back down there you know one of the things that i'm hoping to do um is uh, Really, I'm I'm building what I'll call a travel planning and mm-hmm. relocation service to help people through this very process that I just went through. So, you know, whether they're coming just for vacation or kind of scouting, um, I, I think having been through the school of hard knocks, um, that's something that I can I can do for people uh, to mm-hmm. kind of ease that 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 process. So. 
I'm planning on doing that when I get down there. And um, the other thing that I'm working on uh, over the last 12 years here in Key West, I've been involved with uh, producing, you know, I'm a total food person. And um, of course, Oaxaca is considered, you know, the gastronomic center of Mm -hmm. Mexico. The food's amazing there. And um, so for the past 12 years, we've been producing the Key West Food and Wine Festival. And we're thinking about maybe trying to bring the show to Oaxaca and do a Oaxaca food mezcal wine event. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's just still in the planning stages. Uh And I, I think even, you know, when it comes to when you say wine to people like Mexico does not come to mind. But in fact, as you know, because you live in La Paz, you know, that northern region of Baja is a big wine producing area. Mm-hmm. And there's some other regions now uh, area is, that yeah. are producing some really nice wine. So I think there's a lot to offer people who are into food and drink and, and kind of that part of the cultural immersion. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, we're trying to get that off the ground and hopefully it'll happen next winter. Awesome. I love it. Yeah. I, when I'm in Mexico, I try to only drink Mexican wine. Um, there are lots of great wines down there. Um, they're a little more expensive than the Chilean wines and things. There's places where they just have really, really inexpensive wine. Uh, but you know, let's, uh, support our Mexican wineries. So yeah. Why not? Yeah, and also you are a writer, right? Did you do some some work with uh, International Living, which I think is how we got connected? Yes, uh, I do some writing for them. And in fact, uh, just this this month, May, I had an article uh, published in the magazine titled Why We Chose Oaxaca Over 30 Other Mexican Towns. So uh, because that was for the magazine, for subscribers only, I can't just provide a link, but if someone is interested to read the article, I'm happy to send you a PDF. Um, you can just email me um, my email, uh, and I think you'll gonna yeah. Put it- I'll just put a link to your email down below, and okay. uh, and they can just yeah. Click so on that, uh, send you an email and ask for that. Ask ask for Thank that, you. and if you're interested in knowing more about the uh, food mezcal wine extravaganza. Um, Drop me an email and I'll make sure we keep you in the loop as our plans unfold. Perfect. Yeah, I'll have all those links down below. So, um, yeah, this was wonderful, Donna. Thank you for sharing your journey here uh, as you're working your way into, I guess, would you be living in Oaxaca full time? Is that kind of the plan? Are you going to leave? That's, the yeah, that's pretty much the plan. Um, yeah. You know, maybe we'll be here for a month or so. Um, but Yes, that is the ultimate plan to really ease into that full time. It's it's a big leap, but you know, I we're we're up for it. Awesome. Well, I love yeah. hearing your story and hearing what you've learned so far. Uh, maybe we'll have to do another short video once you buy a property. And I have a strange feeling that you're going to be renovating that property at least <laughs> somewhat. So we'll have to hear what goes on at that point. So yeah, and thank you all for for watching. And if you have any comments, uh, leave those down below. Uh, Donna's email address is going to be down below too. So you can ask her any questions or ask for that uh, PDF from International Living if you're not already a subscriber over there. And yeah, hopefully this has provided you a little bit more of that uh, inspiration, a little bit more seeing that, yeah, it's possible. And there are so many different ways to make this work. You could make it work like Kat and I just jump in and and buy a house or you could make it work like Donna is like a a slow process of really selecting the exact perfect place for you and then finding the perfect house and trying out different neighborhoods. So everyone has a different way of doing this and it's Mexico. It's whatever, whatever goes, as long as you're being polite to everyone and having a good time, then you're doing it right. So I'll see you in another video. There's some videos probably between the two of us. Uh, from other expats living down in Mexico. Hasta luego.